All right, folks, back at it. Hey, last uh, last unit for uh, first semester here. So a couple big uh, big announcements for you here. Um, your quizzes are going to be next Monday and Tuesday. Um, uh, tests for this chapter will be the 28th, 29th, which are Thursday and Friday, but it will go on semester two scores. Okay. Uh, there is no final for this semester. And then later missing work is due next Wednesday. Okay. So we are going to talk about collisions here. Uh, that is the name of the game for this chapter. Okay. So here we go. Uh, calendar for you. This also go up online for you, so you can see it there as well. Um, basically, this week we're going to talk four types of problems for this, and four different interactions as far as collisions are concerned. You can see the schedule for next week. Um, you know, first and second hour, you're going to have your quiz on Monday. And you can read that. I'm not going to waste your time with that. But notice Wednesday, um, missing and late work is due that day. So anything from semester one that you still have to turn in or get done needs to be done by that day. So I got a couple of days to grade it and get it taken care of. Uh, I'll also have the quiz open for you so you can look through it if you want to from one to one. Okay? And then you can see tests and all that stuff coming up later on when homework is due and everything. Okay. All right, so first and foremost, some intro stuff for us about what's going on with uh, collisions. So first, we got to talk about momentum. Now, momentum is something we talked about in the past, right? Um, it's that feeling of when you stop late for a stop sign and the car continues to creep forward, all right? Symbol for momentum is P. Remember, that meant progress by uh, Gottfried Leibniz, right? Um, so our formula is P equals MV. So P is measured in kilogram meters per second or a newton second. Um, I'm probably going to lean towards the first one, kilogram meter per second. Uh, mass has got to be measured in kilograms, and the velocity has got to be meters per second. The velocity we won't change, momentum we won't change, but I'll mess with you with uh, with mass. I'll give you grams, so then slide a three to the left to be able to get it to be kilograms. Okay. Uh, impulse. Impulse is the change in an object's momentum. Now, impulse becomes a big deal for us, especially when we talk about collisions, because what ends up happening is, is we can gain or lose momentum, meaning we can transfer it to something else. All right? And the way that we can do that with is either a force over a moment of time or a mass with a change in velocity. So if you think about a collision, right? the deceleration that happens, that's going to create an impulse or a change in momentum. Okay? Uh, conservation momentum for us. So, uh, conservation and momentum for us means that the total momentum of the system always stays the same. As far as we know, that's that's the case, and that's the truth right now. So, um, what we look at is is that especially with collisions here, our momentum is going to be conserved, right? It has to go somewhere. So, um, in an isolated system closed system, when objects collide, the total momentum of the object is the same. So what you see here is that when we start to talk about momentum total, in the final bit of it, meaning after a collision, that should be exactly the same as the momentum total in the initial part of it, right? And through the four types, what you're going to see is, is that there is a difference in them meaning that we have the first two types are based on a collision with a stationary object. The third one is a collision with an object that raises it to a height. And the fourth is a head-on collision, all right? So in all four of those cases, what we start to see here is that momentum will be conserved between the beginning and after the, the collision. Momentum is a vector, so positive and negatives do matter here hugely, all right? Forward versus backward um, become very, very, very crucial for us to understand. All right. So, in collisions, momentum is transferred from one object to another. The only way that this is the only way that it can be transferred. All right. However, how much momentum gets transferred based on the objects depends on what the materials are like. Right. What we mean is, you know, think about you know, running into, you know, a wall or running into or falling onto the floor. 
right? If you've got a pad there, like one of those big track high jump pads that are about that tall, and really nice and squishy, those help make that momentum kind of slow down, so to speak. That's why padding is so important for us, right? Um, or are they rigid? Meaning that that momentum is going to directly transfer the return, so to speak. Okay? Think of um, like the opening slide, billiards balls, right? So you're playing pool, okay? And instead of using, you know, really, really hard billiards balls, you use tennis balls, right? Not a lot of momentum is going to be transferred into those tennis balls, all right? Um, when I played solo push softball back in the day, right, we would play, you know, some league games and some tournament games with, with these balls that when you bounced them on the ground, on the cement, they bounced right back up to you. We also played tournaments where after the first hit, the ball compressed and it began to fly like an egg, right? And the first one, where that ball bounced like a, like a regular bocce ball, basically, you could hit balls crazy far. And the second one where that ball was squishy and this formed, you'd be lucky if you hit it about, you know, 200 feet, which is really, really short. Okay. So squishy versus rigid become a big deal for us. All right. Two types of collisions or two classes of collisions. Elastic, where zero kinetic energy is lost and bounce off each other perfectly. This is a hypothetical type of collision, meaning that if we were to look at pool with an elastic collision, we wouldn't lose energy. There'd be no sound, there'd be no heat, there'd be no friction. Okay? Any elastic, some possibly all kinetic energy lost to heat. All right. 100% elastic collisions are physically not possible, right? Because any collision, what's going to happen is, is there's going to be deformation, right? What we're looking at here is some sort of high end carbon fiber mixed with diamond like material that would say that these atoms are locked into place and no matter what happens they're not moving they're so incredibly rigid that they're so strong all right now unfortunately at this point in time we don't have that type of material and really we're going to have some small amount of movement it may not look like it meaning if you look at slow-mo pictures of contact with baseball or like on the front where you saw somebody's face and you saw their nose moving over, right? There's always going to be some deformation for us. 100% okay? inelastic collisions are very possible. A completely inelastic collision simply means that they, they collide and stick together and everything stops, right? Meaning that what we have happen is, is that that car hits and it sticks, right? That's an that's a hundred percent inelastic collision. You got two cars going head on and they both stick and stop. Right? As scary as that sounds, that is a possibility. All right. Any real life collision that involves bouncing apart, right? Um, I remember driving up to Dodd in 185th, and all of a sudden there was a car accident that happened there. Right? This one truck got hit, bounced, turned, the other truck got hit, and and bounced off, right? That's partially inelastic. It would be absolutely horrific for the human body if all of a sudden you were to get into a car crash and bounce off completely. So you're going 60 and the other person's going 60 and all of a sudden, boom, you bounce off and you're going 60, meter, 60 miles per hour the opposite direction. Folks, our bodies are not designed for that kind of, that level of traumatic experience, okay? So, um, what ends up happening here is some of our mechanical energy, or in this case, kinetic energy, gets turned into thermal energy. Now, be aware. If we were to talk about bouncing apart or something like that, and thermal energy, we're not talking about the Hollywood-style one. All of a sudden, you see an accident and fire erupts. No, we're just talking about heat enough to bend metal or move metal or something like that. Okay? If there is any motion after the collision, the collision is partially all right, collision type one. A moving object collides with a non-moving object and sticks. So what ends up happening is, is that you have a stationary object, boom, and they stick together and they just move off together, all right? 
For us, no friction is going to be present. Oh boy, here we go. The age-old question. If an H2 Hummer hits a smart car, oh man, this one's good. I like this one. <laughs> Please understand, I do not like this in the real world. I love it in the physics world, but in real life, not a fan. All right, so here we go. A uh, 3,000 kilogram H2 runs into the back of an 800 kilogram smart car at rest. They move off together at seven meters per second. Assuming no friction with the ground, find the initial speed of the Humvee. All right, here we go. So when we look at this now, what we see are a couple key points of interest, right? This is our mass of our H2. This is the mass of our smart car, right? We see that it runs into the back of that smart car and that smart car is sitting at rest. That means that the initial velocity is zero. They move off together at seven meters per second. Okay? But because they move off together at seven meters per second, that becomes incredibly critical for us, right? So we ask, first and foremost, what is moving at the end? And then what is moving at the start? Well, if we look at the end of this all, we can see that these two, as it says in the problem, are gonna move off together at seven meters per second, right? So they're both gonna hit, stick, and move together, right? What's moving at the start? Well, in the beginning, what we see is the smart car is at rest. So it is not moving, all right? That means that the H2 is the only thing that's moving. According to the conservation of momentum, if they're gonna move together at the end, where did that momentum have to come from? It had to come from the H2. Okay, let's run it. So at the end, like we said, we've got both of these two moving together, right? So if they're both moving together and they both stick together, well, we've got a mass there, right? We've got 3,000 and we've got 800, okay? So what we see is they're both moving together at seven meters per second. Uh oh, I don't have my calculator. I'll get on the next slide, okay? 26,600, all right? So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take 3,000 plus 8,000, 3,800 times seven, plug those into a calculator. What you're gonna see is the final momentum here is 26,600 kilogram meter per second, okay? And once we multiply those two together, that's our final momentum. So then in the next slide, we ask what's moving at the start? Well, just the H2. Again, if that smart car is at rest, contextual clues, folks, what's in the problem? What are they talking about? Key terms like rest, at stop, stationary, become absolutely paramount for us to understand in this type of problem, okay? So just the H2. So because just the H2 is moving, it should have all the initial momentum. All right, so what that means is, okay, if it's got all the initial momentum, it has 26,600 kilogram a meter per second of momentum at the beginning, all right? So with that being said, if we know how much momentum it has and we know how much mass it has, what we're able to do is say, all right, I know the momentum and I know the mass. Does that mean that the smart car doesn't have any momentum? Yeah, it does. The reason being, it's at rest, it's not moving. You can't have momentum at rest. You can have inertia, but you can't have momentum, all right? So what we then do is we go ahead and say, all right, we know the mass is 3,000. So then I'm just gonna go ahead and take 26,600 divided by 3,000, and I wanna find that the velocity at the beginning of this whole endeavor was 8.87 meters. So the H2 went from about, what's that? Uh, it's about 20, uh, yeah, about 20 miles per hour. Um, once it hit that smart car, it slowed down <laughs> to about 16 miles per hour as it was driving that smart car through. <laughs> I'm sorry, if you own a smart car, I apologize for the uh, vividness of this event here. All right, <laughs> anyway. Um, I'm gonna encourage you to run out and try practice 7-1. There will be a walkthrough for it. Um, the difference in, uh, in this one now is that you're gonna see uh, on the bottom here, we're gonna ask you to find kinetic energy and the energy loss. 
all right? Um, that becomes a big deal for us as we run ahead and being able to talk through how that works, okay? Uh, section one homework will also be available today. Um, I would encourage you to look that over prior to Monday of next week. Uh, I tried to rewrite the homework so that it was specific to the collision types and uh, go from there, okay? All right, talk to you.